So if when I go to do you place my kitchen cabinets, are you acting as me that bad? They just the people that had the house before me twenty some years ago. Well whoever had it before me. <laughs> I was a young like, couple that were rehabbing it for sale. They put the wrong kind of cupboards in the style of the house. The wrong kind of cupboards. Yes. So I've lived with them all these years. And like, you know, while I've been working on other things around the house, and we're getting kind of close to where we're going to be the kitchen. I'd love to have So they're pretty nice cabinets, but I've come to the conclusion that I want to be instead of I was going to just reface them, but I would have had to restain them. Instead of restain them, and, and the work that would have gone into that, Okay. With the, with the faces and everything, we just have been about the same as getting new cabinets in the style that I want from the beginning. Might not be as good. Well, I'm going to get wood and understand them myself because I want the white right stain. Right. So, yes. it's, it's a long story. But yeah, I've tried many many ways of not getting rid of my cabinets. That's, well, that's what it takes. But it looks like that's what's going to happen. So, do you think there's a resale market for? Or two poor to help people. I got like side deal. I hope we can I thought you were going to ask me if I knew somebody would make some for I said it's one of those boards where people feel that you have to be really qualified. But you don't have to. Oh, that's yeah, yeah, we there. really need. You know, you know, you know, so there are so 12, but you really need somebody <laughs> from the community. You know, we have a lot of professionals, but you need somebody from the community. Sure. Yeah. sure. He needs something. <laughs> he needs something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that'd be great. Greg Jacobson can make you somebody. He's a bit pricey. Good evening. I'm, it's 7 o'clock. I'm going to call to order the. Uh, Council Committee meeting of December the 4th. Uh, Mr. Ruler is absent because of family situation, so he will not be with us. Uh, the first thing on the agenda on the Committee of the Whole is we're going to interview some uh, people that apply for our boards and commissions. And keep in mind that we will not vote on that tonight. We will vote on it at the, eight, the December 18th meeting. Uh, so we'll start, and the first one was civil service. Uh, is Lee Higgins here? I don't see him. No. Did we hear that he's not coming? I did not hear from him. All right. Why don't I have these? Why don't I have these? Okay, we'll move on to the Income Tax Board of Review. Peter, are you here? Thank you. Come on front. We'd ask you to give your name and address and kind of a little short summary of why you'd like to be on this board. Uh, you've been on it before, so I, you know what they're doing. And maybe we'll have some questions for you. Come ahead, Peter. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, you for the you Come up and Mike, please. Name and address for the record. Sure. Uh, my name is Peter Dorf. I um, live on the west side of town, 156 North Chestnut Street. And I want to thank the, thank the council for the opportunity to come before you. I... I'm not sure how much you want here, but basically I've worked for Liquid Carbonic Corporation and Ernst & Young uh, early in my career. And then I saw the light and I went into education <coughs> and I've taught at the University of Akron, Morehouse College down in Atlanta, Kennesaw State down in Atlanta. And for the last 30 years or so, I've been at the Kent State Stark campus. I just retired in June and so I'm now Professor Emeritus at Kent State. And I would like to serve on the, I'd like to participate in the community and um, on my background and expertise seems to fit just perfectly with the Income Tax Review Board. And so that's the opportunity I'd like to pursue. Okay, how long have you been serving on that board? Pardon? How long have you been serving on that board? Two, two, two years. years. Two terms? No, just years. one term. Just one. Okay, it's two years in. Yeah. All right. Um, <clears throat> question from anybody? Heidi? Yeah, tell me a little bit about um, 
what the board involves and like how many times you've met and that kind of thing. I'd kind of like a little synopsis of Excellent. your participation. The, uh, <laughs> I, I applied for the board the last time around and I, throughout my entire career I've always had Monday and Wednesday evening classes as well as day classes and for most weeks I also had Tuesday and Thursday evenings. But I, so it met once right after the I joined the board and I was unable to make the meeting. I was unable to make the interview last time, but now that I'm retired, my calendar's clear. So my involvement previously was very, very low. Mm -hmm. So you'd like another shot? Uh, yes, but I was, to the best of my knowledge, it only met once. They don't meet that often. Right. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Are you done, Heidi? Mm -hmm. When? Uh, no, I, actually, I was just going to ask, you answered it, I was just a, was going to ask you uh, to describe your involvement, um, but it, it sounds like a restart. It, <laughs> you, just, you just had that one meeting, so it's probably but, yeah. not a lot to that. Roger? Yeah, so Peter, in your mind, what does this commission do from your perspective? That's an excellent question. Well, I haven't participated in a meeting, <laughs> um, but I, I suspect if there's uh, some contention relative to income taxes and who's responsible or however it works, it would come before the board. I, I assume that would be uh, the large aspect of it. Mm -hmm. oh. Yes, the, um, that board, um, typically what it does is um, if a taxpayer indicates that they did not live here or possibly they thought they paid their taxes and there's a penalty, they might come and say, well, I'll pay off my taxes, but I'd like the tax board to forgive the penalties. And th those are the kind of questions that mm -hmm. the tax board would, would look to. Finish, Roger? I'm good. Anybody else? Okay, Peter, I think we're done. Thank you. Remember, we're not going to vote until on the 18th, so. Thank you. All right, we have another candidate for the income tax board. Matthew, are you here? You want to come forth and give your name and address and a little rationale why you want to serve on this board? Questions? Yeah, Roger? Matt, I see that you had a bachelor's in psychology from Kent State. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how that kind of fits with the accounting piece? So, yeah, my um, original uh, uh, degree program was in journalism at Kent State. And so I did that for a couple of years until I realized maybe I didn't like it as much as I thought. And so in the meantime, I'd taken uh, a lot of psychology classes that I enjoyed, and so I started, uh, I decided to finish my degree in that, but in the meantime, I had to decide what I really wanted to do, and that's when I, I kind of got into accounting, so as I was finishing my psychology degree, I actually did all the undergraduate accounting coursework, and that led to an internship uh, in accounting, and eventually we got it all now. Heidi? Do you foresee any conflict of interest with your work in public uh, Municipal income taxes already? Um, no, I mean, I don't work in a, a city tax department. I work for my clients, you know, advocating for them uh, with tax departments. Um, I don't really know anybody personally in any tax department outside of just talking to them on the phone, so I don't really see that that would be a conflict. In, in um, I mean, I, we do have some clients in the city of Kent, but it's pretty, it's very limited, so. 
Thank you. Anybody else? I have a question for right. you. Oh, right. Go ahead, let Heidi go first. Well, she wasn't done. Oh, okay. well. Okay. Oh, go, go ahead, ahead. Roger. I no, no, go, her. Heidi. Well, Matt, I guess the question I have is, is that you, you have a real varied background. It, would, is there any other commission that you might have been interested in uh, that? Uh, um, I, I guess I'm, I'm open to anything. I, I thought that this was great. Thank you. Okay. Heidi? Yeah, I'm reading the, a little bit about the income tax board review. It says something about such members shall not be adherents to the same political party. What does that mean? I'm, it, it, I'm sorry. There, there's something about a political party in this discussion of uh, the income tax board of review. Such public members shall not be adherents to the same political party. One of each. Yeah, do we have, are we restricted in cho choice by political party here? Like, do we have to pick based on a political party? No, it ain't. Mm -hmm. That means. That's a good question. Um, it is a good question. It, it, it typically means that you, you, won't, you won't have two Democrats or two Republicans on the commission. I'll take a look at this and we'll, we'll make sure that that the board, the members are in compliance with the rules and regs of that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's no applicants for the loan review of Park and Rec. I'm going to start with Kathleen. Are you here? Um, name and address for the record and a little rationale why you would like to be on the park board. You can take that out if you want. Can I see that? Is it on? <laughs> no, it's on with it. Did that? You guys are gonna have to start over. I took <laughs> notes. <laughs> we heard. <laughs> Here we go. There you go. Hello. <laughs> My name is Kathleen Weiler. I live at six two one Park Avenue. I. Um, have been in Kent uh, on Park Avenue for about two and a half years. I have two little girls who go to Davie Elementary School and are involved in a lot of the Park and Rec programs. Um, but beside that, I was a longtime head field hockey coach at Kent State University. I have uh, 20 years plus in teaching, coaching at all levels. Um, the reason why I'm interested is just I think I can really contribute with the experience I have in coaching, um, not only youth programs, but managing and um, uh, contributing all my knowledge that I have in, to all the programs that um, my daughters are involved in and I've, I've observed. I could help with um, training coaches and um, really good brainstormer, idea person. So that's it. All right. Uh, Gwen? Um, can you talk a, a little bit about just kind of a two-part question? If I sure. Could, uh, how you have either participated with or used uh, Kent Parks and Rec uh, Department or, or your interactions that you've had with it, just mm -hmm. like either personally or professionally, okay. and also what is um, maybe an area, um, obviously you have some expertise here, of, of something specifically that you feel you can bring to the park board. Sure. Um, I think when, when we moved to Kent, um, my daughters are, my one daughters are really athletic and loves sports and wants to try everything. And um, I was still coaching at the time and couldn't give my time to coach her at, at that time. So um, I've just sort of observed her have just great people really um, coach her, but I do think that um, I've seen that just they could be able to run a practice a little bit more efficiently. Um, just with little people developmentally where they what they could do with that use of time and keep them moving i just think that we have so many great young kids in these programs and i feel like i could just help the coaches be more efficient because they're volunteering their time a lot of them are moms and dads who are working hard outside their home and then they're giving their time after and when they show up they could have curriculums they could have tools to be able to um, help the kids 
Mm -hmm. What was the second part again? Uh, just, I think you, I think you answered it. Then I answered everything. Your, your interactions with it, like you mm -hmm. know, if your kids participate or if you Definitely. participate, and then right. You know, yeah, I just feel that, you know, the downtown so revitalized. I think just the Parks and Rec is, is already has so many offerings, mm -hmm. but it could be so robust. Anybody else? My question is, I, he I hear you talking about the youth program, but I, I don't hear anything about senior citizen program. Oh. Where do you stand with it? I don't, I don't oh, know whether yeah. you still have your parents or not, but what would mm -hmm. you like somebody in that age bracket to be able to do in Kenton oh, with gosh. Parks and Rec? I think it's super important. My parents don't live here. I grew up in the Philadelphia area, and I know um, from what I've observed here and the offerings that I've seen, I think they offer quite a bit. Um, I think... Um, do I specifically know like what would would someone want and need? I think I would like to ask probably my mom and dad what they would want and what they would offer. So, so you think it's a valuable thing? Oh, completely. I think it's more than important. I think there's so many um, just levels to our community. Okay. It's a very valuable and important thing. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Hey, Roger, <clears throat> I, I love your enthusiasm because uh, you still have that coaching enthusiasm. Oh. That's how you come across. <laughs> and that's hands-on. That's, that's mm -hmm. really hands-on. Do you think that there will be a conflict because you're also going to be on a board that's creating policies? Mm -hmm. And there's a real difference between being on that policy-making board and then being hands-on and actually directing. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you see any conflict there that you couldn't work through? Uh, I don't think so. I think, you know, as a coach, I would have to be on certain boards that you would have to vote on certain things for players and make policies for coaches and our associations. And I think you have to just really have an open mind and be able to learn that craft. So I don't see that being an issue. Good. Rodney? What uh, do you view as your priorities uh, as it relates to uh, the appointment, if you were to receive it? What uh, they've got issues of perhaps seeking out a, a new building. Uh, you've got mm -hmm. issues of perhaps future development. The mayor had brought up one of the things with the with the seniors, uh, mm -hmm. how those might meld. Uh, have you uh, given that thought? Uh, I know that there's a new director, and I would be, you know, interested, obviously, to see, um, you know, in his undertaking, what are his sort of priorities and expertise. But I think, um, I think you all know. I mean, facilities are important, an important thing. Um, I just know with involvement of of my kids just scheduling seems challenging and things like that. But I think I would just need to know more before I could say what my priorities would be. What kind of community outreach would you advocate? Oh, I mean, I think we have, I would advocate for obviously the seniors, the youth. Um, I know that, you know, the river in the area here is super important, keeping that going. Um, our park system's really great too. So I think I would just want to know more. <coughs> more about um, the areas. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm fine. <laughs> we have some good paramedics no. here. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anybody else? All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Robert, are you here? Same thing, name and address and kind of a brief description <coughs> why you would like to serve on the park and rec board sure. um, evening um, thanks everyone for the opportunity um, so my name is robert shigenda I live at 1078 daily on drive um, i know i i know uh, i believe joe is your is he is he your cousin or brother jim jim or joe joe both of them okay both yeah okay both brother. all right so um <laughs> So why am I here? Um, I've been a coach for, uh, let's see, youth soccer for roughly about six years. I've got two daughters in uh, the Davie school system. Started coaching my youngest um, at somewhere around four or five, and uh, she's kind of flamed out at least on the soccer program. Um, my youngest, though, is, is a pretty good soccer player. I've coached her now for three full seasons. Um, so I've got to experience the coaching side of the youth uh, program 
right? Got a lot of interaction with um, with some of those folks over in, the, in that building. Um, I also coach with um, Joe. Um, he is the uh, assistant for my daughter's softball team. And so I've got to um, talk to him and experience some of his, his thoughts on what what the entirety of the program is. And so um, I'm interested in, in joining the council so that I can help to build something, right? So it seems like we're at this point in the community, at least from a sports perspective, and you know, we've done a lot um, around here, but from a sports perspective, it feels like we are um, building um, and we're trying to build from the bottom up and, and yet our high school coaches are trying to build from the bottom down. So I'm not so sure that there's a lot of communication going back and forth. And when you, um, I grew up in Manaway, so not too far from here. And when you talk about smaller communities, it's easier to build from the, from the top down. And so I think it's a bit more challenge in the community uh, of our size. Anyone else? Mine's the senior citizen thing. What, what do you think you can bring to board to enhance the senior citizen programming? Um, so I have some good friends that are neighbors of my parents that are physical therapists. Um, they do a lot of, uh, I believe it's uh, silver sneakers, um, things like that where uh, we can actually um, encourage our elderly to go ahead, or senior citizens just to go ahead and get out and be active in the community. Um, I would probably advocate for some sort of um, senior outreach program where we actually have somebody go out and, and try and um, um, almost uh, try and uh, recruit, right? We, we recruit and we try and get people to come and get people to try it. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be something I would do there. I, I believe our park system should be just involved as used as they are with the senior citizen, seeing we are living longer now. <laughs> yes, yes, as, as my parents like to put it to me too. Right. Robin. Yes, sir. Uh, along those lines, um, would, would that be a, an issue that you think you should have, have perhaps have a standing committee of senior people uh, that give you uh, the type of continual interaction with them uh, so you can establish policies that actually emanate from uh, senior concerns, people who are impacted uh, as seniors? That yeah, I think it would be extremely important, actually. Um, I, don't, I don't think that a bunch of 40-year-olds sitting on a council can advocate for somebody that's 60 or 70 and actually understand, right? So unless you're going to go out physically and take polls, which you could do, right? You could go out and take polls of, of your senior citizen community um, and get their opinions. Um, but it would be best off if they could advocate for themselves um, at meetings. Roger, you brought up a good point. Um, a couple of years ago, we. Uh, looked at the parks and rec department looked at building a facility expanding yes parks and, and recreation if you have paid close attention we've expanded uh, bike trails mm -hmm. we make our we're making our community more uh, walk friendly and bike friendly <coughs> and since that uh, that attempt went down i've talked to a lot of people how do you as a if you sit on this board how do you address the element of the community who really believe, and I'm not being critical of them, I'm mm -hmm. just saying they really believe that this is all a waste of money, that we shouldn't be expanding our bike <clears throat> trails, that we shouldn't be concerned about any of this because they're not going to use it and they really don't care about it. And then you have the other side, many of us who advocate for it. Yep. How, do you bring, how do you bring some understanding to, to that element of the community who they don't see this as a, as a value? So we have to listen. Right? You have to truly listen to the concerns of the folks that know that their taxes are going to be going to pay for those kind of things, at least over, over the, the short term. Um, and then I would probably try and figure out, in some form or fashion, how much money leaves the community. Because, by the way, I'm one of them. I have a, I have a gym membership at a, at a facility outside this community. So I tell you right now, I voted for it. 
um, I felt like it would be well worth our money. Um, and, and we thank you all for the bikes and, and walkways, my kids and my wife, and uh, I believe all of yours too. I, we use them all the time. Um, I was actually good friends with Dan Smith when he was still alive. Um, and I, I was, you know, we've been here for uh, 15 years, so we got to see this evolution of the city from what it used to be when I was a, a teenager, if you will, um, to what it is now. So it'd be neat to be part of that rebuild, at least on the rec side. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? John? Yeah, for the law director, what exactly is the job description of the Parks and Rec Board? Well, they are the appointing authority of um, the... Um, John? the director and the commissioner, but they also set policy and, and decide what programs are going to, um, they're going to offer and things like that. They, they, they basically run the department. Yeah. Anybody else? Thank you. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Heidi. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I, I'm still trying to, in my mind, I'm going over and over your statement about building from the bottom up and the, the, the schools building from the top down. Are you saying there may be some kind of conflict between what the parks are doing and what the schools are doing and maybe we can bring that, that together in a synergistic way? Um, conflict might be a bit of a strong word. Mm -hmm. um, differences of opinion. Um, so when I coach, we spend, um, at least for our youth soccer team, we spend the first 10, 15, 20 minutes working on things like stretching running, um, actual physical activity, um, and then we do skills, right? We actually just go and teach what we call foot skills. Actually spent time at the head, the high school's head soccer coach. Um, we sent my daughter to his camp that he does over the winter, and we literally watched him and all the things he does. I think he's fantastic. Um, and so we took all of those things from him and I'm teaching it to five and six year olds. Mm -hmm. There's no reason you can't teach them the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, he's a good example of how I feel like he's starting to build from the top down and starting to um, try and implement a program, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and I talk to Garen a lot because I, because I coach, uh, <coughs> excuse me, obviously. Um, and so I kind of like the direction that's going. Um, just want to be part of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, the next one is Peter Orlando. Name and address for the record. <clears throat> Hi, my name is uh, Peter Orlando. I live at uh, 550 Roosevelt Avenue in Kent on the west side. I've been a Kent resident since 1975. Uh, I wanted to clarify one thing first. I'm applying for a five-year term. There's also a one-year term for Jack Newsel who resigned. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so that's a uh, complete a term. Yeah, yeah. yeah Jack uh, uh, was forced to resign because he's no longer a, a resident of Kent, and he had one more year on his term, and he served nine years. So uh, we're certainly going to miss him. But uh, I uh, first was appointed to the Park and Rec Board in 1995, and uh, so I've been there for a while. Our previous director has been there for 26 years, so we came on about the same time. He came on before me. But uh, I have been very active in uh, Park and Rec. I've, uh, I've coached, I've participated in the programs. Uh, uh, I've coached uh, soccer, softball, baseball. Uh, <clears throat> and I've uh, participated in, uh, uh, as a volunteer in uh, many of the activities. And for instance, Art in the Park, I'm down there the whole weekend, my wife and I generally run the information booth. Uh, I've done, uh, you know, some of the runs. I was down there for the turkey trot, just shaking hands and everything. But um, <clears throat> but uh, uh, it's something I've really dedicated myself to. I think I've done a really good job in representing the city uh, and the Park and Rec Board. Uh, I've been involved in the hiring of all four classified or unclassified positions uh, at Park and Rec, and I see Suzanne hiding over there, and I'd like to thank her for all the help, because when we picked a new director, this was the first time we used someone from the city staff to do it, and uh, it, that wasn't available in the past, and uh, I'd like to thank Suzanne for the great job she did. She kept us really straight. <laughs> and, uh, 
Um, but um, right now, I think we have a trying to avoid a problem on our board. We only have two senior members. That's myself. Like I said, I've been there since 1995. And uh, Debbie Smiles, who's uh, been there not quite as long. Uh, Jack was there for nine years, and he had to resign. We have two new members. One is literally brand new, and he represents the school system. And the other one started last January. And uh, there's quite a, a learning curve. And I think with the new director, I think I can be very helpful, and Debbie will be very helpful too, to uh, help the new director fit into his new job. I mean, we have a guy who came in from Coleraine County, or Coleraine Ta Township, down near Cincinnati, and uh, he uh, did have some roots in this area, but having a new person coming in, I think he needs the support of an experienced board. And, uh, you know, two senior board members, and we both met with Kevin, and I usually see him on a weekly basis. And I'm not saying he's overwhelmed. He's very qualified, and uh, he will be a good park and rec director, or he wouldn't have been selected. And uh, I would like to continue to be able to uh, support him and the rest of the staff. Uh, you mentioned about seniors. Uh, we do have some senior programs. We have a little wellness center over there on West Main Street, and we do s some exercise programs for seniors in addition to uh, Silver Sneakers. Uh, your former member, Melissa Long, is uh, very active in the senior um, um, <clears throat> circles, and she is uh, She's not officially uh, a senior coordinator, but she certainly keeps us on our toes, and and uh, she tries to expose us to a lot of senior programs. I think if we had a facility, we could probably do a lot more, because when we were talking about the facility, even though it was a scaled-down facility, we were going to have a, uh, at least we had verbal commitments from uh, University Hospital to rent about 5,000 square feet and run their programs there. And this would bring the seniors in for cardiac rehab, dietary training. We were going to have a kitchen in there, the whole bit. Uh, and also for younger people, we were going to have a nursery in there. Uh, this isn't dead yet. We still want to go back and look at a senior center. Or a Well, there, there was a debate. Do you want a separate senior center or do you want a wellness center? Uh, the overwhelming uh, opinion is from the experts that... Uh, you need a wellness center to incorporate the seniors, have even special facilities there for seniors, special classes for seniors. And uh, we can do that, uh, but it's a lot easier to do. We're doing some of it now, but it's a lot easier to do with a facility, and that'll be coming back. Uh, one of the big things I've been preaching to our new uh, uh, park and rec director is, and also preaching to our board, is that uh, we need to work with all the stakeholders. And I think that's probably why our levies, our two past levies, uh, didn't work right because uh, they came close, but they they weren't passed because we didn't work with our stakeholders. You know, we're not uh, politicians, not experienced in running political campaigns. Uh, we have to do this with uh, our own money, and I think most of the board members and a few other people kicked in, and we put up a couple of signs and had some focus meetings, and nobody attended. Uh, we got to do better than that. Uh, uh, <clears throat> when I talk about stakeholders, I mean uh, city council, city administration, uh, <clears throat> the uh, park and rec department, they all have to work together. Yeah. We'll get a wellness center, a real nice one, if everybody works together. But we can't work alone and do this. This isn't something that council puts on the ballot and they say, okay, you're on your own. We all have to work together. And I include the school system in this too, and also Kent State University. Uh, when the Wellness Center at Kent State University was originally proposed, I was on that committee uh, for a while, and it was supposed to be only for the students, not for faculty, not for staff, just for students. And then we had a couple changes in presidents and administration over there, and they decided they needed some customers that would pay for the facilities. Mm -hmm. And so that, that sort of changed that dynamic. And... Uh, we still talk to them. They want to build something on campus. That's not going to work. But we need to get all the stakeholders together. Uh, school system, that's a whole other problem uh, because uh, we are probably the biggest paying customer, the city of Kent through Park and Rec is the biggest paying customer uh, for the uh, 
Kent school system. Uh, we certainly pay more than anybody else, any group, for the swimming pool, which I thought was kind of interesting because uh, that was a, I went to one meeting and had a few suggestions and was told not to come back to any more meetings, but uh, <laughs> uh, for, for certain reasons. But um, uh, Mr. Idoni uh, restructured their whole financial system and uh, so that kind of just about doubled the fees that we pay. And uh, it's difficult to work with the school system because uh, they want paid for everything. And we do pay them. We, we pay them for uh, many of our programs. And uh, I wish we could get around that somehow. But we have that problem where the school system is Franklin Township plus the city of Kent. And the city of Kent is just the city. So, you know, we're working with two political entities that don't have the same geographical borders. And that, that's, that's problematic, too. And uh, I guess you guys can work that out. <laughs> but um, anyhow, I would like to continue for another uh, five-year term and uh, probably be my last term. And uh, I thank you for uh, all the uh, support that you've given us in the past. And uh, I hope it will continue. Thank you. Heidi? So you want to go for another term. You've been on there a long time. What do you want to accomplish? I mean, what do you want to go out on? Well, I'd like to have a nice wellness center that pleases everybody. That would be a, a big plus thing. And I'd like to have uh, programs. Uh, just, you know, people look at park and rec departments and they say, oh, sports. You know, And I'd like to have programs other than sports. And we do have a lot of programs other than sports, you know. I was down to Park and Rec office a couple of weeks ago and I was talking to Nancy and they had these big, uh, bi uh, like gar uh, plastic garbage cans is what they look like. And they had balls, inflatable balls inside of them. And I says, what the heck is that? Well, this is something new. We're starting a class. You make music and exercise at the same time, you know. And that, that kind of stuff is, you know, things that we keep coming up with. And uh, I have to compliment uh, Ms. Pizzino because she's extremely creative and uh, drove Mr. Idoni absolutely up the wall. But uh, we do have a lot of good programs because of it. And uh, we try things, and uh, uh, most of them work. And the ones that don't work, we try something else. Thank you. R Robin? Uh, two questions. Uh, one of them, uh, the issue, at least the way I kind of perceived it, with the Wellness Center is a lot of people viewed that as redundancy. Um, based on the existence of a uh, wellness center at the university and surrounding communities. How do you think you're going to deal with that the next time that comes up in outreach and education to residents? Uh, well, uh, we get that a lot. Why do you need a wellness center when you have Kent State University? And then you ask the person, which one do you use? Well, I don't use any of them. <laughs> uh, you know, people don't like to pay taxes, and that's a big thing. So when you talk about a levy, uh, you talk about building a center, redundancy, people say, well, if I don't have to pay for it, yeah, go ahead and build it. But uh, you mentioned P Kent State. That's for Kent State. When uh, our park and rec director, our current park and rec director was down at Athens University, at uh, Athens, Ohio, at Ohio University, where they built their center, the school said, this is for us. You want one, you build your own. And mm -hmm. Kevin was the lead man on that one. And uh, so there, you know, that, that's my answer on redundancy. And we've done the studies. When we, uh, we looked into the um, wellness center the last time, we had a consultant come in and we did a lot of surveys and studies on need. And then when we looked at an aquatic center, we did the same thing. And uh, I do want to mention that uh, we have um, been talking to Brandstetter and Carol, who's doing the city hall right now. And they are going to do our master plan. We're going to do another master plan. Our last master plan was... I think completed in 1995, and we're going to start another one. And uh, I've been preaching on them about, uh, in fact, we had a meeting with Brandstetter and Carol at our last board meeting, which Gwen attended. And uh, I think you were there, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you were there. And uh, I started preaching about, you know, bring the stakeholders in. And they said, oh, yeah. So for about two years, we'll be having focus groups and meetings and all kinds of surveys and everything. And, uh, you know, we're, we're certainly going to consider all the needs. And they, they do this. Uh, I, I, I was very interested in the process because uh, the first time we worked with them, they had a lot of statistics. And uh, 
and I, you know, challenged, where do you, I mean, being an accountant and an auditor and all, I said, well, where do you get these statistics? Well, they built like over 250 different facilities, so they have a lot of stats. And uh, so, okay, I'm a believer in them now to a certain extent. But uh, anyhow, uh, they cover all the bases and they do all their demographics. They have uh, a lot of the work they do themselves. They do a lot of work on overlays. Where do people live? Where are parks? Where are facilities? And they start laying these things over. And then you get these very detailed charts and maps, you know, to look at the demographics <clears throat> to see what the needs are. And uh, it's a very interesting uh, concept. And I've worked with them before. And uh, it'll probably take two, I don't know, maybe three years to complete this. Was that your idea, of that Gwen? Or? I if we has the board voted on it yet? I don't know if I. Well, they've uh, the board has voted to go ahead on it, and uh, I don't know if Kevin came to you guys or yet or not, but uh, mm -hmm. we have to do a budget allocation, and uh, we're going to send them down here and talk about money. If, if you want to, if council wants to pay for some of that, that'd be okay, you know. <laughs> Roger, you got a question? Well, you brought up a good point. You've been on this board. You and I moved to the community in 1975. We both moved right. here at the same time, and we watched our community. We have a unique setup here because by charter, Parks and Rec flies its own ship. And it's kind of interesting because do you think that's working effectively, or do you think it would be more effective if Parks and Rec became an integral part of city? Yes and no. And the reason I say yes and no is that uh, it is not a politi it is not a separate entity, and we've had members of council that have have treated it as a sen separate well, the entity. Charter, I mean, when you read the charter, yeah. it, it pretty much. Yeah, well, they're they're city employees. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was done. Uh, we went over the history of that. It used to be a separate park board and a separate recreation board, and why did they do it that way and all that stuff and. And uh, what it comes right down to is, and uh, you may agree or not agree with this, but you know the uh, the bottom thing was well, if you uh, if you make the uh, park and rec board an advisory board and have all those employees working directly under the city manager, then no one's going to vote for your levies because they're not going to trust that the money will go to the park board, and and the, the money will go to 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 to, uh, to parks because any money that comes in on levies that is designated for park purposes must go for park purposes. Mm -hmm. You know, and we try to only spend about 50% of our money that comes in on levies because the, uh, the retention that we keep is what we use for our matching funds for the different grants and also for any property acquisitions that we want to make. So, uh, I mean, we're, we're, not as, we're not as separate as uh, it appears on paper. I mean, basically, the, the job of the Park and Rec Board is to hire and fire the director and let the director run the department. And, you know, if the director wants to increase rates on a shelter house or something, he can't do it himself. He has to go to his board. The board is not as proactive as you might think. I mean, I always, I, I think it's great that when I, if I come here and I see other people applying for a position because I can't tell you how many times I came down to council and there's like nobody applying for certain boards and maybe I'm the only one applying for the park board and I'm glad that somebody's interested in it. I'm glad that we have two positions. <clears throat> but, um, you know, uh, the work rules that the city administration sets up are followed by park and rec employees. They're not independent employees, you know. And as a park board member, I don't have the right to go over and tell uh, Mr. Tuttle that I don't like the way his crew is cutting the grass, you know. I mean, I... There's no executive authority given to uh, park uh, 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 to uh, park and rec board members. Thank you. Is there any other, John? Well, it's it seems like you have an awful lot of information about the park board and what's going on up there, um, and and I I get information too, but I don't know how accurate it is. Now, I was told that. The rec center at Kent State is like a mandatory enrollment for the students. Otherwise, they pay for it whether they use it or not. Mm -hmm. And then they also, you have Silver <clears throat> Sneakers and some, some other organizations that pay there. And plus, you have independent people that go and become members. And the information I had is that with all that, they still are losing money. How true is that? Um. Well, I can't say, I don't have facts sufficiently on that, but I know people that have worked there. 
uh, and I know people in the administration at Kent State, and uh, they they are losing money on it. They never really built it to make money. It was built as a student service because all of the other Mid-American Conference schools who compete for the same type of students were having these centers. Kent State was one of the last ones to get into it. And, uh, but they, they started out saying it was going to be a community wellness center. And then uh, when Mr. Idoni missed a meeting, they, turned, it, they changed the name to the Kent State Student Wellness Center. And uh, <clears throat> so um, he was on that committee too. But, uh, <clears throat> um, you know, they, they, do, uh, they do advertise. They, they are fairly expensive. You know, you probably want to park your car, you pay money. You want to take a shower, bring your own towel. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, mean I, I can't say officially, I'm not part of Kent State University, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I would imagine if they're out recruiting from the general public, it's because they need the revenue, you know. And, and my kids went to Kent State, and I know a lot of people that did, and uh, sometimes you go over there and use the services, they had to go in at 6 o'clock in the morning, the place is really jammed, you know. I walk around there really yeah, and I'll be over there probably in two weeks with a Boy Scout troop, that's another thing I do. And, Further questions? All right, thank you, Pete. Thank you. thank you. So there's two positions open for the park board. One is a full five years, and the other one's a partial time. So thank you. Uh, Shade Tree Commission, uh, Jim, are you here? I am. Come on out front, buddy. <clears throat> Need your name and address for the record. <laughs> So my name is uh, Jim Jenkins, and I live at 438 Relham Drive. It's down on the south side. And uh, I think the first question is why I, I want to be part of the Shade Tree Commission. Well, um, I went to Kent State, graduated there, and I... Uh, moved here about 10 years ago, and I work here for a tree care company, um, Davey Tree, and um, I feel a real strong uh, civic duty, civic pride for Kent, and I think I can take my experience with working with other communities. Um, and apply that to uh, advise the Shade Tree Commission and also the mayor on beneficial things that uh, I've seen in other communities implemented um, and hopefully grow the urban forestry program within the city. Um, Kent is a vibrant community that takes a lot of pride in their trees. And I'm uh, officially a tree hugger. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it gives me great pleasure to be considered for this position. And uh, I'm open for questions. All right, questions. Anybody? Gwen? Um, so as you um, live in, in, in Kent, um, what particular areas, or is, is there a particular area that when you go past, you think to yourself, ooh, this could be so much better um, with this tree or that tree? Or uh, I work closely with Brad McKay on uh, a problematic areas within the city. Um, North Manaway has been, uh, I don't want to say an eyesore, from a street tree perspective, but mm -hmm. um, I almost had to hide my eyes when I went to corporate. It, uh, it, it's, um, it's good that we're taking the initiative uh, and coming up with a plan to revitalize that. Um, and there are certain areas throughout the city uh, that uh, I'd like to see 
uh, consideration given to in terms of maintenance and, and tree plantings. And uh, I, I think I can take the experience that I have with all of the, the arboricultural knowledge that uh, my company has been bestowed upon me uh, and do a, a good application of that and hopefully advise as much as I can and uh, on uh, arboricultural practices and standards, really. Jack? Yes, Mr. Jenkins, you're a certified arborist? I am, and I'm uh, also a board-certified master arborist. Okay. So uh, can you tell us how that would help you in that position? Well, uh, just having a, a real good general knowledge of all things trees um, can help in terms of coming up with uh, effective and efficient plans of action, um, especially when it comes to goal setting objectives for the community in terms of trees. I think it's, um, it's beneficial to have that, that kind of background to make a good practical um, uh, decisions when it comes to how to deal with trees in uh, an urban setting. Thank you. Robin? Um, how much <clears throat> interesting that you're, I mean, you seem to be very engaged in it, and I guess that's part of your livelihood. Um, what kind of community outreach do you think we ought to be doing to make people more aware, this is a tree city, I believe, <clears throat> make people more aware of the importance of, uh, of this kind of vegetation and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, do you have uh, a much more aggressive agenda? Do you think that this uh, commission should be uh, engaging the public in? And uh, how would you go about doing that? That's a very good question, Robin. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and that's one of the biggest things that I deal with on a, a consistent basis with communities is how do we take um, the benefits of trees and promote that uh, so that there's an importance to them. And when you set that importance, you know, they're worth, to, they're worth an investment in. So um, there are different things that are uh, out there in terms of um, promoting what those benefits are in a quantifiable measure. Um, the, the classic technique is to put tree tax on uh, different trees throughout the community that illustrate uh, in dollar amounts what those <coughs> benefits are. Um, when you take a look at a tree and see that on an uh, annual basis that tree gives to the community a hundred dollars per se in annual benefits in energy savings and storm water retention and aesthetic benefits uh, that the u.s forest service has come up with and i uh, helped uh, put together that model mm -hmm. over the last uh, 20 years of my career with Davey. Uh, I think that is one of the ways that we can use that as an advocacy piece uh, to promote the urban forestry program and also set a, a, a standard and an importance on the trades that we have in our community, more so than what they already serve as. No, thank John? You. Um, yeah, I grew up in Kent and uh, grew up on South Water Street. And growing up, uh, prior to me growing up, my uncle planted an oak tree in what was called the Devil Strip back then on the side of the road. We had nice dirt uh, right of ways or Devil Strips on the side of the road. Beautiful oak trees all up and down Water Street. And the same thing on Manaway Street. Well, now with expansions of the roads and everything, it's hard to get a dandelion to grow between the sidewalk and the curb. 
and I realize nobody likes leaves that fall off of trees and stuff like that, but how do you fix that? How do you, how do you make that progressive as an arborist to make that street beautiful with trees again when there's no dirt left? That, that's a huge problem in especially heavily populated areas. Um, I worked extensively with the city of Pittsburgh on how to deal with that very issue. Uh, some of their tree lawns are no more than two feet. And how do you uh, accomplish the goal of planting large trees to give great benefits um, with consideration to the surrounding buildings or and streetscape, trees even. yeah, any trees whatsoever, um, and there's different techniques that can be applied. Um, most notably, siva cells, which are uh, planting structures that you can put in smaller spaces uh, that optimize the root uh, area within those um, structures and um, bump outs which allow for additional spaces in and around the trunk of a tree. Uh, so those are just one of many different techniques that um, cities have employed to deal with that very problem. Um, and to be honest with you, I, I, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, when it comes to urban forestry. So I can take uh, the lessons learned from other communities like Kent, the size of Kent, and uh, make sure that we're moving in the right direction. Well, can you use it a bump out? Well, if you've got a four-lane road when you're right up the curb, is there such a thing as a bump in? <laughs> or is, are there trees that will grow to give some beauty but not raise the sidewalks up? <laughs> it's called, uh, and it's a very common uh, uh, slogan in my industry, uh, right tree for the right place. Um, mm -hmm. And I've added to that for the right reason. Um, so different species grow in different forms. So making the proper selection uh, is the key to overall success of the individual tree within those spaces. So there is hope. Uh, there's always hope. Um, you know, I've... Here. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I've seen, you know, oak trees that grow to 100 feet tall right under power lines, and that's no bueno. Um, choosing the right tree like a crab apple might mitigate some of those long-term issues that we have with trees, uh, especially when it comes to utility lines. Mm -hmm. Any other all right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. There's nobody for the stormwater. We have one for the sustainability. Why not? Name and address for the record and kind of uh, rationale why you want to serve on the sustainability. All right. My name is uh, Wilder Ritz. I live at 401 Bowman Drive. Um, I am currently a junior at Kent State, uh, working on a major in environmental studies with a minor in sustainability. Um, I've lived in Kent almost all my life, and I think I would love to give back to my city. I really love Kent, and I would love to work with it on becoming more sustainable. I think it was already a pretty sustainable city, but there are always things that could be done. Okay. John? Like what? Um, <laughs> I think uh, working with uh, some of the restaurants and uh, shops downtown on reducing plastics and um, improving energy efficiency and finding a way to somehow reward them on their efforts on reducing those things. Um, especially by perhaps um, letting the public know that certain places are being more sustainable than other places. Because if you've realized um, over the past few years, the term sustainability has become very popular in the business world. And if 
to uh, reward and let people know that these businesses are being sustainable and some others are not, then that would be more of an incentive for some businesses to become more sustainable. Do you think, or, or what are your feelings about porous surfaces uh, for transportation and walking that verse versus asphalt and con regular concrete. I think that is something that is would be a great addition to any city. Um, Stormwater is a very big problem in a lot of places, especially with oils and uh, runoff not being able to go back in the ground. So they uh, run off into places such as public water supplies. They can run off into the river. Um, which, could contaminate some water supplies, um, uh, potentially harming uh, public health, which is not good. Um, and just uh, allows to give back to, um, never mind, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Are you done, John? Yeah. Heidi? You know, um, we signed, um, we, we signed, we, we um, we uh, validated, or whatever it was called, the cl the Paris Climate Accord. We approved it, or you know, whatever. What is it called? Resolution. 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 Okay. You're welcome. <laughs> and I know that the Sustainability Commission has been charged with finding ways to help us address uh, meet meeting the the uh, mitigating climate change and how we can prepare uh, to um, help the city of Kent so-called weather climate change as best we can. Do you have any suggestions, like kind of off the top of your yeah, head? Yeah, um, mm -hmm. possibly. I don't know how practical this would be, but um, green roofs would be a, an amazing way to uh, combat the higher um, rates of temperatures that could be coming with a uh, uh, climate change in the future. Mm -hmm. um, as most of you may know, um, the urban heat island effect, um, uh, black surfaces and uh, just concrete um, increases the temperatures in urban settings. And with increased green space and vegetation, that heavily reduces that effect, reducing the temperatures in uh, urban areas. And so things like reflective roofs, uh, reflective surfaces on the sidewalks and streets, uh, the color white instead of black reflects more of the heat rather than black holding in the heat. And also with the green roofs, it holds in more of the storm water, reducing runoff. Very done. Yeah, Great thank you. Yeah, being a student at Kent State, I was wondering, would you be willing to do some outreach programs with the students there? Because I know that your generation is supposed to be very environmentally conscientious. And yet, when I go to school and I go to the Starbucks, I mean, they just get, they're just extremely wasteful, even though Starbucks has reusable cups and reusable mugs and things like that. I mean, there's lots of waste. Students go and they go to like a Circle K or a convenience store and they leave their cars running as they go in. So these are things that are really adverse to being environmentally friendly. So would you be willing to do some outreach programs to students at Kent State? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, yes, I have noticed that as well, um, especially in those food court areas, uh, seeing just lots of plastic waste being thrown in the trash rather than recycling, which they could be. Um, but yeah, I would definitely be open to uh, doing outreach programs for uh, promoting the use of uh, reusable cups and reusable straws and things such as those, and also just promoting the yeah. Well, don't, don't be surprised if we ask you to do something. Of <laughs> course. <laughs> Are you doing, Tracy? Yeah. Robin. Uh, one of the questions you you kind of alluded to it. Um, the aspect of incentivizing uh, some of the things like outing some people who are meeting, moving more toward uh, being sustainability conscious as opposed to other businesses that aren't. Um, one of the bigger deals is always going to be, and I, I especially uh, looking at uh, the uh, Paris Climate Accords and us opting out or whatever the hell we're doing. 
We were supporting it. Uh, uh, no, no, I meant yeah, us as a us. president uh, opting out. Um, is the measurables. How do you establish that in a community of size? How would you then, as a member of the uh, Sustainability <coughs> Commission, uh, start establishing a, a plan of action that deals with how we're going to be able to make this uh, a more livable environment? Uh, what would you be advocating for? Your new voice, your new eyes coming to the coming to the fore. Uh, we have to have that kind of dynamism. We're going to be looking at uh, making something really worthwhile uh, out of the Sustainability Commission. Not that it's mired in some type of, you know. Mm. But it, 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 there is something that we, we just aren't quite, quite grasping. One of the things we've been kind of alluding to all night, I believe, is that how do we engage the people who live here become more involved. What would you do to do that? Outreach, bringing people to the table, educating? Um, I think possibly doing um, events downtown more focused towards uh, sustainability and environmental um, issues uh, would be a great way to get the uh, people of Kent involved. What about neighborhoods? Neighborhoods? Um, Uh, possibly, uh, why don't one think about it? <laughs> They're all part of the community. Yeah, I know, you're right. Um, downtown's a neighborhood. Just saying. Uh, so's the <laughs> south end, so's the west side. Yep. <coughs> not, not, not to put you on the spot. We're, we're having a little dialogue. Yeah. I've, I've, but, but the issues of outreach and how you get people to the table. A lot of settings which are more intimate, mm -hmm. where you have an opportunity to educate people and, and, and engage them, is something I think that, uh, especially with somebody new like you, mm -hmm. something you can contemplate. I mean, uh, it's not on you, but it's just a thought. Um, I guess, uh <laughs> um, You don't, take time to think about it. You don't yeah. Know. yeah. You don't I mean, that's a big project. Robin, we'll get that answer to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Wilder, I'm, I don't have a question. I just have a statement. I just think it's great that somebody your age is applying for sustainability yeah, because absolutely. it's your generation that will be suffering from yeah. the <laughs> lack of sustainability that our generation has done. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Glenn, do you have a question? I, I agree. Just to, to follow up on that, I think it's great. I think it's great that you're studying um, environmental studies, and I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased that you want to apply those skills already. You haven't even graduated with it yet, but you already want to apply and get involved in your community. So um, I'm pleased to see you here. Thank, thank you. you. Have a question. Roger. Bob, I just wanted to say I, I'm impressed with the fact that you're going to school, you're working, <coughs> I that's love your eight planet box, by the way. And uh, <laughs> I think that that says a lot about young people. Because mm. a lot of times young people are given a bad rap, in my opinion. I think that your, your willingness to do that and put yourself out here, uh, very commendable. Very Thank commendable. you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just a quick question for Hope mm -hmm. and for you, actually. This is a three-year term? Yes. OK, OK. And so. Will you be able to commit to a three-year term? Um, yes. Uh, actually, since I am going to school in Kent, that will keep me in uh, Kent for a little bit longer. Um, and I'm also planning on going to grad school, possibly in Kent, so that would be keeping me in Kent as well. And you can run for camp for council sometime. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Tracy? Uh, so do you own a car? Yes, I do. I ask every sustainability applicant this. What kind of car is it? Uh, it is a 07 Toyota RAV4. Four cylinder. Four cylinder yeah. RAV4. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 got, I got a question. Being, in a, being employed where you are, have you kind of leaned towards suggesting management do away with 
plastic bags? Um, yes. I actually do not currently work at Mark's oh. anymore, but... Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, um, you don't have to answer my question. <laughs> <laughs> but I have thought about that plenty of times. All right. Okay, is there anybody else? All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank uh, you. Once again, we're going to vote on the 18th, and uh, you, you will have to get five votes just because you're the only one running for that position. If you get four votes, we're going to have to re advertise so you have to get five votes. All right, thanks, everybody. You, you know, our, our boards and commissions are very important to us. Uh, they're kind of part of the foundation of the city, and without a strong foundation, we can't put a roof on the building. So thank you. Yeah, you don't need to do All right, uh, streets and sidewalks. Yeah, I'd Mr. like to call that streets and Mr. sidewalks Sidoti. committee together. Okay, I see we're going to have our staff report on sidewalk maintenance and regulations. Hope you know who's going to run that. Um, yes, I'll start it off. Okay. Um, this um, uh, referral came from Heidi when she was thanking and, and appreciating the city for um, the beautiful sidewalks in front of her <coughs> Keister home. And what she had done was asked about how do we keep them clean, um, whose responsibility is in certain situations. So um, after that meeting, uh, what we did myself, uh, Melanie and Bridget, got together, we looked through the code and we also knowing, you know, that they knowing their own areas, um, we came up with a list that was attached to Dave's uh, communication. And they're basically uh, just every area uh, that the city has an ordinance on. Um, but we have ordinances that um, prohibit the accumulation of leaves and grass on the sidewalk, snow and ice removal. Um, um, other maintaining, cleaning, and repairing. Um, all of those code sections are out are, are outlined. Um, of course, the engineering department handles the sidewalk program. Community development handles um, issues with weeds and grass in the public right of way. Uh, the service director ha handles everything else. So any complaints. Um, would go to her and I am told by um, I think Bridget and I had this conversation that um, if, if one of her guys goes out on a housing issue or whatever and they see they, they see an issue I believe that they report back um, to make sure that someone is aware that um, that there is could be an issue with some other areas of the property that don't necessarily come under their realm of enforcement mm -hmm. Yes, Heidi. Thank you. I, I appreciate that, that, that you guys pulled this together. I guess one of, the, one of the issues I have when I walk the sidewalks is now there's so, such beautiful sidewalks, but they didn't do every single one. Um, the ones that haven't been done in some cases have, you know, obviously they need to be edged. Sometimes they have leaves on top of them. They're not really serious issues. But over time, they do erode the sidewalk and make it harder to walk. And there is no requirement that people edge their sidewalks. Um, but there is, you know, you have to maintain your sidewalk and you have to keep dirt and ice and snow and, and leaves and grass um, off of it. Um, and, 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 and you're right, it's not the most serious thing happening in town. So, so it also becomes a matter of where do you want your, to put your enforcement activities? So um, if you see something, it's probably um, Bridget and Melanie, um, it's probably going to be more of complaint driven. I, we don't have any necessarily, other than um, Jim's sidewalk program, mm -hmm. we do not have any people that go out and say, we're just going to go look at sidewalk issues. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's either, either it's complaint driven or um, if someone's out there and they notice deterioration, then, then it's reported or snow and ice. Okay. So, so follow up question to that is, so, so say somebody doesn't rake their leaves and this, this actually has come up. I've had complaints from people um, about my neighborhood because, you know, there are some rentals that are not taking proper care whether the sidewalk's in good condition or not, it, that creates a hazardous condition. They don't rake their leaves, or say they don't edge over years and the sidewalk is becoming deteriorated mm -hmm. as a result, and that has happened. We've had sidewalks replaced because of that, actually, and that's a shame because the taxpayers then have to pay for their failure of the property owner to maintain the sidewalks. <coughs> 
do we have, is there, is there some kind of a, I mean, if somebody leaves, you know, a, a snow obstruction on, we have, we have a civil, um, we, we have a way to, uh, we have a process. Is there a process for something like leaves? Because I did, I did make a complaint on behalf of somebody else and the person from the city who responded literally just went out there and raked the leaves themselves. Um, because That's, they didn't, I don't feel like they felt like they had teeth. Um, well, we, we just passed a section last year regarding, I, I believe we did, the, the leaves and the grass um, on the sidewalk and in the gutters. Yeah, uh, in the street. In the street, okay. Yeah. Maybe we need to, maybe we need to like look at some of this more refined and, and also shrubs that hang over the sidewalk. They have that. They have that, okay. Uh, but, okay, I'm sorry. That's we do also. when it's overhang for we, we do that with brush and stuff with leaves it's a moving target i mean sure. you get a call and it can be moving so we we actually it was probably paul or eric that just dealt with the leaves if a complaint comes it would be extremely difficult with those two and with all the enforcement they have to do if they were also doing edging and le leaves i will tell you that that would be extremely challenging especially since they're also inspecting for rental licensing so they do egregious violations, and it is complaint-driven, as Hope said. So. Okay. Other questions from council? Robin? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I don't think I must have been paying attention uh, with the issue that had been settled regarding snow removal. Um, I know that at one point in time, uh, uh, Jim, Silver, it indicated there was a problem based on what the state indicated uh, and uh, whether or not there was a conflict based on our requirement uh, as regarding uh, enforcement of snow removal and where the state was, which was much more nebulous. Well, Supreme Court. Well, it's, the it's, Court. The, the issue there is, I, I'll tell you, if I got a letter from the city telling me to, to, um, to shovel or de-ice, I, I might not do it because uh, you, you start messing around with your sidewalk and, you, and someone slips and falls, you're going to be in oh. much more civil liability <laughs> than than if you just let God do what God wants to do. Amen. Amen. What we usually, because again, limited staff, <laughs> we do not enforce natural accumulations in front of households. We do man-made obstructions. The Community Development Department will go out when a landscape company plows a parking lot at Burger King. Burger King is every year, so I'm going to use them as my example. And they block the sidewalk. We cite, we go out, we warn, we give a civil offense warning then they have to address the issue. But we deal with man-made obstructions only on the walkway. Okay, I, that, that, that was my misinterpretation. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I yeah. thought that what we were talking about here was the requirement that people have to uh, remove snow from the sidewalk. It, it is a requirement, but it's, no, I, I, it's not enforced. It is not enforced. Right. Um, however, if any of you see any issue out there that you think that needs to be addressed regarding like the weeds and things like that don't hesitate to call my office I don't mind sending a letter out saying hey we've got this we've got this uh, rule on the books and we'd like you to comply with it mm -hmm. Mike I think you no I don't have anything oh you're okay Gwen so on the on some of the sidewalk stuff on like some of the edging and some of the leaves and things like that I'm I guess my concern is uh, who's making the determination whether this is just aesthetic uh, versus something that's actually a hazard. I don't feel like a lot of residents have a great desire to turn the entire city into a homeowners association <laughs> where edging their lawn and raking leaves within seven hours after a leaf fall. I mean, because <laughs> different trees, they drop at different times. People were posting pictures of ginkgos that like all dropped like almost simultaneously. Right. I feel like we should get our shade tree person or <laughs> back up here. But, uh, but who would make that determination before we send a letter out? I mean. Well, I would I would hope that I could give it, Bridget's department or or uh, no. service department a call and ask them to take either go out and take a picture take a or, or, or give me give me a, a heads up. Okay. Common sense prevails with okay. enforcement, um, okay. especially with Paul and Eric. Actually, we got a call about leaves. Um, 
today and came back with a picture. I could have picked them up with my hands. Yeah. So oh, we like don't, mulch. right, and like don't, and then right, kind of it's reasonable, it. it's when it's a large obstruction, if someone like, you know, actually goes out and were to put it knee deep on the sidewalk purposely, Got it. then we would definitely be there. And it is complaint driven mostly, although the guys do see stuff in the field. And if we're at a rental, you know, that we're inspecting and they see something, they will absolutely flag that for sure. But it's, it, it, it has to be reasonableness. If you're creating where someone can't walk, or, you know, then obviously that's a problem. Or if they feel like it's, you know, looking uh, very obvious to them, then they will. But the complaint today was addressed by staff. They literally just fixed it themselves and picked up the small pile of leaves. So. <laughs> Thank you. Jack. Yeah. I, I'm all in favor of cleaning up the leaves, but I have to tell you that I've, I've done leaves five times in my yard. I can't keep up with the leaves in my yard. There are still leaves on the trees in my yard. And I, it, it becomes a very sticky situation. Um, I don't have sidewalks, thank goodness, so I don't have to worry about that. But leaves, leaves are blowing across the street mm -hmm. into the, onto sidewalks. And it's just something that I think that if we, we have to be, I think we have to use our common sense in this area. It just could be a nightmare. The code enforcement officers do have concerns with leaves because where did they initiate? I mean, at least with the man-made snow, we right. know we know that the landscape company from Burger King blocked that because we can tell by the way it was left. Right. But we cannot do that with leaves. John, I don't know. Maybe somebody could answer this question for me because it, things have changed recently uh, with regards to leaf removal and grass mowing and snow. Is there an overabundance of money going to teenagers and youths? that they don't have to work for money anymore? Or is there a lack of youth <laughs> in a community? You don't understand the younger generation, okay. John. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you need an iPad or something that costs two or 300 bucks, don't the kids like to work for the money to buy that anymore? No. That's how I supported myself. I don't understand that. Yeah, I don't like that. So there's something, yeah. that's a question we yeah. can deal with in this community. Somebody have the answer to that? I no. mean. No, John. Other so questions fixed. from. Uh, any, any other questions for either Melanie or Bridget? Oh, go ahead. I just want to comment that we do have a great working relationship with community development. And if Paul does have questions or concerns, he always comes up and makes sure Sherry has it or talks to Brad. And so if they need assistance with um, central maintenance, they'll come and get that as well. So um, we're doing our best to keep up with it. It is complaint driven, but we do try to work really well. And I've got to give them a really big thumbs up because they do a great job at looking at those things, tree trimming, those kinds of things. So. Roger. Oh, John. Yes. I'm going to be serious on this one. Do we now still have some type of assistance for seniors where, like, you know, Bridget, last year we had that lady, somebody come up and did all her leaves in a bag and left them there, and then she got was going to get cited for it. Do we have somebody to help? That was a bad volunteer situation. But, yes, we actually just completed, uh, that would have been two weeks ago, uh, Rebuilding Together did the Senior Service Assistance Day in Kent. We did three that were substantive repairs, which included like porches and things like that. And then the majority, I think there was 29 that were gutter, leaf cleanup, brush. Uh, all of that should have been removed. I did receive one call from one of the seniors that their gutters were not cleared. Well, they, they, we don't let volunteers clear on a second story. They have to be on first story only for many reasons, obviously. And someone had promised that they would clear those gutters and hadn't. So we're actually paying a little additional to have a service go out there and do that. And we will remind the volunteers next year that we can't actually get up there and do that. Okay. But it went okay, well. Okay, here's my question. If there's an old person other than me that needs help, how do they get it? We don't have it on an ongoing basis, but if you do have someone that needs assistance, send them my way, email me. Um, I do work, we do work with some churches and different groups that will help with those types of instances. We are having challenges right now with volunteers. I mean, Kent State hasn't been able to even help us with volunteers for the sidewalk snow removal program. I actually did a reach out just about three weeks ago to the university again. Um, we actually had our staff out and shoveling for the three volunteers 
don't let the HR manager hear me because I'm sure there's liability reasons when they're doing that type of activity outside of their job description. So if we can't get volunteers this year, we will be suspending that program. Um, I sent a follow-up email saying, have you found anyone? I mean, I literally have gone to the Office of Civic Engagement. That's what they do. Um, and we had volunteers committed to show up and they never showed. We even had the shovels at the, the prop, at the seniors' houses so that the volunteers didn't have to worry about getting shovels and they still didn't show. Mm -hmm. So it's just uh, been very challenging. Now this would be like a dramatic, just for an example uh, purpose though, but did we ever try to promote something like you get Charlie Thomas and have bags of leaves for draft beers or something? I mean, some type of an <laughs> no. incentive program for volunteers? Government and alcohol. No, no I, like I'm like, I don't, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't think we could that do that. That was just an yeah, example. Was, but. I don't think we could do that, unfortunately. We've actually reached out to faith-based organizations yeah. throughout. Yeah, I know. So maybe okay. we, the city could pay teenagers. Yeah. Beer? Beer? Yeah, beer. beer. <laughs> they would probably be. Okay. okay. I think oh, that's <laughs> Are there any other you know, that questions? Get in the next that's week. Uh, anyone, anyone out there in the audience left that wants to ask a question about that? I don't think so. Well, I, I will say this, just as the uh, chair here. I appreciate Hope and Bridget and Melanie uh, giving us this list <laughs> because I know that when we get phone calls, it'd be nice to have this laying on our desk and we can refer to uh, the... Uh, I'm the the codes so thank you mm -hmm. mr kuhar well i'm almost speechless here but uh i do have one thing on the agenda it's the proposed kent franklin jed contract amendment yes that um late this late this um summer um, we noticed that in, between the uh codified ordinances of the city uh, there was a discrepancy with the codified ordinance and the jet agreement for re regarding water surcharges in the codified ordinances it indicates that if you are a business outside the city of Kent the surcharge the sur water surcharge is 50 percent the jet agreement indicated that uh, those that Franklin jet indicated that those businesses that were not participating in the jet their surcharge would be 25 percent so we, we spoke to the JED board and we asked them to approve uh, an amendment to the JED agreement. Uh, basically, uh, for, at first we asked them if they would just put the surcharge at 50% so it would match our codified ordinance. Uh, they had a better idea. They said, well, why don't we just leave it silent so that whatever your surcharge is, it follows, it follows our businesses who are not uh, participating um, they passed that uh, and it has gone now to Franklin Township and Franklin Township passed uh, that amendment and we are <clears throat> we are asking um, that you pass the same amendment so that we can amend the Franklin uh, Township Kent Jed and Tom is here if you have any other questions mm, I have a question. did I leave anything out okay yeah hi um, I always wonder about how do we how do we encourage more businesses to join the JAD, and is this with this? Do you think this might be a, a, at least a little tiny bit of leverage? Tiny bit of incentive. Uh, <laughs> you know, this affected relatively few accounts. Mm -hmm. Twenty-two businesses that, mm -hmm. that were affected, and it's only only businesses now resident. Um, right. But frankly, from a sure dollar perspective, the amount of money they spend on water in a year. Versus the withholding and profit tax that might be at stake if they join the judge um, can be a pretty astronomical difference, and it's not a huge incentive for, for most of us. And, and frankly, there are very few businesses left that are out in that stretch of state route 59 um, you know, that, 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 would, that can join us in the city water system. So, uh, Akron, the, the Akron Children's. They is cannot. they cannot the railroad track or into the uh, water, water system. Interesting. Hmm. Too bad. Anybody else on this issue? No. Anybody from the audience would like to discuss this? And with that, we would come back to council with emergency, maybe if they have a motion. 
He just made it. Yeah, John, John, listen. Uh, uh, I didn't come back to council. How could he make it? Oh, I heard I it. You did. <laughs> okay, is there a motion? Yeah, Do it again for John. The, uh, emergency. The second is Mike. Mike. All in favor? Discussion. No discussion on the motion? No discussion? All in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Passes? I Okay, yield. Finance Committee, Mr. DeLeon. I yield to the Finance Committee. Oh, <laughs> God. I've been watching. You've been watching TV. <laughs> yes, he has. Maybe we, should, coffee. maybe we should pass a bottle of booze around. Are you, are you up first today, Mr. Bell? Are we up first? Second, third, third fourth, fourth. Yeah. 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 Believe me, without doing two of the intros here, I guess I'm a little out, out of step. But uh, <coughs> anyway, this uh, agenda item uh, for the advanced property tax resolution uh, request for you to do so um, is really kind of Questions? Moved to authorize. Right. <laughs> Second. That need to, that need emergency? What? It's no, it's automatic. automatic. That doesn't matter. Okay, just want to make sure. Good for you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah. While they're walking up, I'll introduce it. Um, as you know, we have been looking for a new home for the health department. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe we found one, and it is with PARDA. Um, they, the, um, Joan and Justin will give you um, the, the juicy details that um, you will need to consider. Uh, I apologize that um, the agreement is not before you tonight, and the reason is um, some of the item, all of the items that Joan and Justin are going to talk about are in the bag. They are there, but there's some little lawyer stuff that needs to be taken care of that um, I'm sure that you um, do not care about. But after, after you hear what Justin and Joan have to say, I hope that you will um, authorize um, this lease. Uh, between the, the health department and CARTA. Jen? I just want to thank you for this opportunity to request uh, this uh, move to CARTA. We've been very fortunate in the past that we have had rates up for rent that have been less than market value. Penn State University has been very good to us. Is the microphone Is that on? on? Oh, it keeps going out. Battery died, maybe? Thank you. So Kent State University has been very good to the health department and the fact that you know they bailed us out when we had when the health department had to move quickly and find a new space when we had to relocate again um, they gave us another space and again was less than market value. Um, we are limited in terms of the different locations and where they are and you can see in front of you Justin has actually done all of this legwork and did all of this um, evaluation of the different properties that could be available to us but basically it boils down to that we're limited by space parking rent costs or the renovations that would be involved in the various properties so we want to make sure that we have a health department location that people can find us that they know where to go to find the health department that they're not wary of of walking in or which door do i use or how do i access and that also that the staff are, are uh, you know proud to come to work in as well. So um, in terms of what we are looking for and what we're looking at, Parta, do you want to, since you did all the work on that, okay, all right. <laughs> so this, uh, page two, 
uh, shows all that PARTA has to offer us, and it really checks a lot of our boxes. It, it's not a perfect location, but it's a realistic location. It, it gives us a lot of what we need and what we would desire and what we would hope for. Uh, there's a lot of potential there. One of the things that our uh, FAB site uh, visitors said, that they were really impressed with the relationship that we had with PARTA, and that being the PARTA hub, we know that it offers great access to people who maybe don't have vehicles uh, but need need health department services, so uh, really offer some great opportunities, and especially in terms of the festivals, we want to get more uh, involved with that, and being right downtown offers uh, many opportunities that way as well. So, in terms of costs, the, uh, page three. Uh, has an outline because we've moved several times before uh, Justin was able to uh, outline the the costs in terms of what it would mean to move and to move into this new space so that's in front of you as well but re really it boils down to the rate is very reasonable part of has been uh, great in extending a hand in partnership to uh, offer us another uh, affordable space and also uh, an up to 10 year lease agreement. And it would be nice to have a home base that we know for an extended period of time and not have to worry about packing up and moving again in another two years. Yeah, can you tell me about the parking? I, I see further down the list there's a 30 minute parking, I know that's free, voucher parking. What, I know that for some people that, you know, $5 or whatever can be pretty prohibitive. Right. Um, they're having to use the health department services to begin with. So um, how, how would you offset that? Right, right now, the majority of the people who use the health department services, they can get in and out within that 30 minute time period. And if they did happen to run over, say the department did grow and we offered services that would mean that they would be in the department for more than a half hour, there was a voucher. Uh, so we would have to, you know, recoup the costs of, of that voucher that we would provide to that individual to make sure that it was, um, you know, affordable for them to come. But as many people have said, you know, when you go to other health departments, you pay to park. You don't get free parking. So I, I think that that would be an extra added incentive that we would do that. Yeah, that's yeah. nice. Thank yeah. you. Um, why are we leaving the current spot we're in they asked thank you um, the lease was up actually um, it was some miscommunication last June the lease was up and they thought that we would be moving at that time and it was only through some quick intervention uh, and the willingness of Kent State to extend the lease another year but they I believe that they would like their property back that they have other plans for that um, so after this June 2020 we would not be able to renew at that present location again and uh, We've been discussing whether the health department wanted to come into the new city building or not. You preferred not to be a separate entity? Uh, no, I think that it would have been nice to have combined services like that, but what, what I, was shared with me was that there we took up too much parking uh, between the employee parking, the fleet parking, and then the people who would also be coming in to use the health department, that we might take up too many parking spaces and that there was not uh, funds currently to build a parking deck that could help offset that. I got my mind stuck into paying for our own parking in our own building, but but anyhow, um, bottom line, how does this cost compare to your cost now? Well, certainly it's an increase from what where we are now, but it's not an exorbitant um, increase. So if you add the parking permits into that, it would be around two thousand dollars. I saw that. So, and what is it now? It's about one thousand sixty. So, it's almost pretty double that. Nine hundred dollar increase. So. Mm -hmm. Furniture. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm kind of curious about the um, the ability of. Are you saying that they're going to be able to go into the parking deck park, and then utilize the the services? If, so. It would be if the if the parking deck happens to be full. It would be just like any one of us having to find places to park. 
Um, there's actually, there's actually will be four designated 30 minute free parking spots allocated for health department use and those would, I mean, I can't say that somebody wouldn't park there and not use the health department, but they would be designated as health department use only, meaning for it's for the public, not, not for the employees, right. but for the public to use the health department. Yes. Uh, yeah, I thought because of the federal funding that designating parking was prohibited. They have designated parking there now. The hotel has designated. Davy mm -hmm. Tree has designated. Yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't know where mm -hmm. you're coming across with yeah. that. What? Yeah. I've never heard of that. It's a look. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. in the parking deck, the designated parking. Right. Correct. It's not on the street. It's not on the street. Yeah. Well, I thought when yeah, we originally right. set up the parking deck, they said that they couldn't have designated and promise anybody a spot because of the federal funding that was involved. No, because from day one, the hotel needed so many spots and that. And that was they got the spots, a number of spots, but they couldn't designate them. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> I'm like one of the only people around that still was here when we started the tech. You are correct. That was the original interpretation of the Tiger Grant. Mm -hmm. It was a strict interpretation, but then because that money came through the era, um, funding. Um, after about two or three years after the deck was operational, discussions PARTA had with the federal agency said that that strict adherence was really not required. So while we couldn't, they couldn't go out and designate every spot in there, which they wouldn't do anyways, there was, a, a, there was an allowance to be able to do what they're doing currently. And it complies. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Bridget. You're welcome. See, I'm not crazy. No, you're not. <laughs> or senile. Close. Or senile. <laughs> Is there further questions? No, I'm I'm satisfied now. Good. If John's satisfied, I'm satisfied. Mm -hmm. You guys have anything further to add to this? No? Okay. <laughs> Move to authorize. Oh, you're in the audience? Okay. Jack? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Back to conference. Let, let that be written. Jack has nothing to say on this. Second. Seconded by Heidi. Further discussion. Yeah, I want to say something. I just think it's terrific. If you can get a 10 year lease and we can get it locked in, people get used to going there. I also think with the building of the new city hall, it's just a walk. I mean, you're talking two blocks, maybe, you know, and I think that that can all work really well. And I'm real pleased with that, that process. Yeah, I just love the way it does integrate with our, our campus that we already have. I mean, and $1.75 square foot, my goodness, was a, for a essentially brand new space, filled out all the, you know, with, you know, ADA, bathrooms and all the stuff that any old building you'd have to go and fix. I just think that's I phenomenal. The building is environmentally friendly too. And environmentally yeah. friendly. I just would hope that we would have some good signage and just to help people wayfare. Yep. So, yay. Good point. I, I just think I'm voting for it. John? Yeah, I, I'm going to vote for it even though I don't like the fact that we're doubling our expense, but it's definitely a good fit for <laughs> the purpose that it's serving and its location. Further? Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thanks. Thank you. Nice job. Nice job. Thanks, you guys. Number three, which is Mr. Coffee again. Budget appropriation. Nice job on this. Mm-hmm. Move to approve. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I, like, I, I like your attitude. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, I am requesting appropriation amendments this evening, um, as I've outlined in my November 21 memo to the city manager. Uh, there's a, just a few items, as you can see, that have been articulated. However, being the last opportunity of the year, I'm including <coughs> language that gives us the latitude to um, to do exactly what Mr. De Leon just said, to up, tie up all the loose ends uh, so that we uh, can make sure we don't have any budget citations, budget uh, issues when the auditors uh, take a look at our year end. 
Questions? Move to approve with emergency. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. You're doing a great job, Mike. Well, I, 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 uh, yeah, I listen to Dave too much. Actually. Yeah, I know. D Dave would have a lot to say, of course, as we all know. Why don't you give us your <laughs> but, story? Oh, snap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell us. Well, it well, didn't well, quite the mean that. The mice will play. Maybe they didn't. <laughs> Put yourself with what you're going to do on retirement. Forget about that. I'm sure it's there. I know you put a lot of work into this, so I want you to get your due. Well, uh, actually, this is my uh, Last 11th and final budget proposal and it will not hurt my feelings if you don't ask hardly any questions but uh, <laughs> that again you're um, certainly this is what I'm here for is to uh, go over and I realize that you may have uh, issues that are not explained in this document um, I do think that Dave's um, uh, budget memo um, was a very nice intro and, and um, as Mike said we have adhered to the principles and methodology budget principles and methodology that we've that I've applied in my time here and I believe in my predecessor's time as well um, so none of that has changed frankly um, there's nothing particularly dramatic about this <laughs> particular budget um, that I at least not from my perspective um, I would simply add that I think quite honestly well, first of all, let, let me first do what I do annually, that is to give a shout out and acknowledgement to my colleagues for their input, for their cooperation in this, because this is, again, not just my uh, end product. Uh, it's been a participatory process. Um, and a few of these people have helped, uh, not her, but uh, <laughs> and, uh, no. <laughs> There's a few exceptions. I won't call them out by name, but at any rate, but. Um, <laughs> No, it, it really, um, it, it is, uh, it's, it's very, it's a, it's a really a good team building exercise, quite honestly, because there's a lot of give and take that goes on. Um, and uh, quite honestly, um, the process is, is, I think, maybe, I don't know if I've got them trained or they've trained themselves or whatever the case may be, but um, um, it, it's a good, um, a good exchange, a good healthy exchange of ideas. And in many cases, um, my colleagues have brought up suggestions where we can reduce budget um, but I can assure you that where there have been increases and even where there haven't been increases but necessarily but where, where we've noted that either in prior year actuals or in the current year trend line on a specific expense line um, we'll challenge you know we'll, we'll challenge them to uh, goodness could, could I continue it, yes, could, could I request one of these books next year? Thank you. Oh, wait, you won't be here. <laughs> oh. I thought you got one. He never really, gives me you one. You and uh, Amy were trade off when he handed them out. No. We cut down printing. We're saving, saving costs. Yeah. Hope you can have mine. So I completely lost my point as to where I was, but I simply wanted to make the point that we do, we, we do go on a, on a line by line basis by department, by cost center. And take a look at what pre previous year's actuals were uh, versus um, the current ask, as well as where they've tre been trending. We, we try to bring that up as current as we can in the, during the year for the year to date to validate the needs of those budget line items. And uh, in, in many cases, we've had concessions um, that, yes, okay, we can trim this back. We, we don't need to continue, but. Uh, uh, in other cases, there's been a legitimate case made where we take that particular line item. There needs to be an expansion, particularly in the areas where we have, for instance, some road, uh, road salt we know has continued to increase. Um, 
uh, dura patch has increased um, in the expense. So some of the, the materials that we use in great quantity, certainly a lot of the, the materials at the uh, water treatment plant, uh, reclamation plant, those types of things we understand uh, have been uh, very subject to market conditions. So the only other thing I was going to say is, it, it, so that's the expense side. And it, it's really the expense side, quite honestly, is just kind of have been like it always has been. This year, what I would say is, quite honestly, my biggest challenge this year was on the revenue projection side. Um, it's just a difficult environment right now to um, to project with a high level of confidence as to what our revenues are going to look like in 2020. Um, you all have seen the uh, the monthly income tax. Is she just rushing in? <laughs> you might want to leave. I don't know. I don't know. Hey, Dave. She's the city manager tonight. I'm sorry. So I would, thank you, thank yeah, you for so correcting me. I the, appreciate it. As you know, the levels of restriction here. I, I, you All got right. me back on the right track. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Good God. We're actually I, hoping you will. <laughs> I am ready for retirement. <laughs> What were they serving before the meeting? No <laughs> kidding, I missed out. <laughs> Something in the air, I don't know. But um, what the what hell were they talking about? <laughs> Mike, you're in charge, but I think you were talking about. You're talking about revenues are hard to predict. Yeah, yeah. the revenue yeah, the projections. Revenue. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, somebody was listening at least. Uh, that's good. But. Um, so that that had that was the biggest challenge for me this year. Um, you all have seen the, the monthly income tax reports. Kind of, it's been a seesaw, seesaw type of thing. The good news on that is, you know, in spite of the seesaw, we're still a net gain at this point in time. We're looking at we're currently at uh, a little over three percent uh, year to date, which is about four hundred and fifteen thousand dollars in actual dollars total for the city um, additional revenue. Um, I'm projecting that we'll probably end up the year maybe just uh, probably just under 500,000 and probably the percentage wise won't be a lot different than the 3% level. Quite honestly, that's a respectable, um, that's a respectable revenue uh, performance for this year, particularly when you look at some of our peers and so forth. But again, talking about 2020, you all are, I'm sure aware of the economic indicators uh, nationally. We've got trade wars, we've got impeachment, we've mm -hmm. got all types of uh, uh, unknowns out there uh, mm -hmm. that are causing great uh, stress in the marketplace. You know, daily mm -hmm. fluctuations, record mm -hmm. highs, record lows um, in the stock market. Mm -hmm. So it's really an unstable and, and very difficult to project kind of environment. Obviously, what we need to do is to hone it down to what is Kent going to look like next year. And there again, we've seen we've seen some mixed re responses in in our um, community um, as far as where we are. But I do believe that overall, um, we will still be slightly ahead next year um, of what this year's performance has been. I'm counting on Tom. Is he still here? Oh, figure. Okay, I was counting on Tom. I'm counting on Bridget now. <laughs> Well, this isn't working out too good. Uh, <laughs> Did you guys rehearse this today? <laughs> it's not the way I planned to do it, but at any rate, uh, it's just kind of the way. Let him speak. Should we have for a motion first? All right, I said all that. Uh, do you want to go through the book? Just... No, no. I'd like no. to. Yeah. We're going to go about it where we did the last few years by just asking questions. And she has a question. So. I think, am I reading this correctly? You have the projected income for this year is 51, about 51 million. That's correct. And mm -hmm. projected expenditures are about 51.8. So we're going to be over, we're going to overspend by about $600,000. What was the number you came up with? About $600,000. We're going to be over budget. You can look at it that way, but that's, I, I look at the way I look at it is on the, on the operating uh, budget level. Okay, is where we are. We are balanced throughout. On our general government side, we're balanced on the operating um, budget level. On the enterprise fund, we are also um, we are also in a plus or a positive position for at the operating budget, meaning that revenues will exceed expenditures. Okay, in 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 those two general areas, enterprise and general government. 
the difference comes into play as it always seems to with the capital spend, which the capital is, is drawing on uh, accumulated reserves in various funds. Okay, so mm -hmm. that means that you know if we, we either underspend or we didn't you know fully spend, we, right. but we've built up enough right. reserves, and so that's where the that's how the deficiency largely right. is is being um, closed. So, so my question is then, at what level do we start to worry? I wouldn't worry at all at this level. No, no, I know. At this level, we're not. But I'm, I, for the future, because yeah, I'm going to be saying. here another four years. I know what I you're saying. Know. You might have me come mm -hmm. back on a periodic. No, <laughs> okay, consulting, is that it? Consulting? Just a thought. Um, <laughs> it's a valid question, really, and, and I don't, you know, I don't know. I know what I know what this means to me, and I know how this is going to be administered under my direction. I have to assume that my replacement is going to have a similar approach. To it, it requires constant, constant monitoring, constant balancing. Okay, because what you try to do in my position is you try to balance the needs of this community. You try to make sure that we have enough to keep us going forward, not just to meet the basic needs but to do things such as you all have um, committed to in the past with kind of a bold but yet strategic investment that you've made in this downtown and, and all the things that have made Kent what it is today. Um, so you have to allow that budgetary freedom, okay, so that those things can be done, but mm -hmm. as long as they're done, again, with a proper strategy, proper balance, and monitoring. Okay. I mean, we don't just do things because we think we're going to make money. We do things because we pretty well know we're going to have a return on this investment. Okay. It hasn't always worked out that way. I will admit, you know, we've had, I've had, you know, I, there's things in this budget, for instance, um, uh, not to call anybody out, but I'll just, I'll just say, you know, the fire department, you know, we added some positions there. I'll be honest with you. I'm a little disappointed. We haven't reduced overtime to the extent that mm -hmm. I thought we would, but in mm -hmm. their defense, they've had a, unusual year with a lot of mitigating circumstances okay I'm hoping I expect <laughs> I expect in the longer run that that commitment to adding to staff is going to reduce that overtime for that, that sector of the budget okay. so um, that, that's just I mean it's just there's no there's no magic answer to it it requires constant balancing <coughs> constant review and constant uh, discipline uh, to make sure and to challenge, and in my role, to challenge the requesters uh, for what for what funding they're requesting. Yeah. Right mm -hmm. yeah, one of the things that strike me looking at the numbers is that the general government fund has gone, um, or the expense has gone up considerably from what we approved in, in, in 2019, which was roughly 4.8 million, to 2020, which is 11.3 million. And I was just paging through, looking at, you know, every, you know, of course the salaries are increasing, including on council, but I don't think we're the ones that are <laughs> adding all those millions to you the budget. You wanna give it back? No, well, I don't think we're the it. problem. <laughs> I don't think there's a problem, for, so to speak, but the portion of general government has gone up as well, vis-a-vis well, vis the whole budget. So I'm that, just that, wondering what's going on. We're building a new city hall. That's that's. What that's, expenses are you are you? I'm talking. You're looking. At, I believe you're looking at page one dash seven. I, yeah. I, I'm I'm th I'm just wondering why why. Yes, that's the comparison page. I was right, looking right. for an overall. Yeah, and if you're looking at 1-7 and if you're mm -hmm. looking at the general government line, you're, yeah. you're correct that the 2019 approves um, is 4,793,000 4, and 2020 request is 11,300. Right. And that, that predominantly reflects the $7 million um, project for the new city hall. So that includes the capital funds. Includes? The capital funds. Yes, because we're not we're not we're not distinguishing in that breakout. Okay. We're not distinguishing um, O and M or personnel or capital or debt service or any of those other breakouts. Gotcha. We're we're re, it's a uh, we're aggregating <coughs> things that would be classified as general government. Okay. What we're doing. Okay, so that includes the capital mm -hmm. funding for the right. 
Great. Thank you. Okay. You answered my question. Okay. Yeah. yeah uh, my wife was out of town for the last couple of days, so I had nothing better to do than to read the budget. And um, <laughs> what I noticed, uh, what I noticed was that really there isn't a lot of change except for that capital. So I mean, it's pretty consistent to the mm -hmm. last year's, except for that seven million dollars. I would say that is the case. Yeah. Now, you know, um, as we talked about in the in the capital meeting, um, we are requesting an add to staff, which would be in the finance department which would be for the purpose of the title we're going with at this time <clears throat> is collections coordinator, which might be a little bit of a misnomer. Well, oh, oh. I think our HR person takes offense at that, but at any rate, it doesn't <laughs> fully describe what we intend for that position, but that, that there's a need, a, a very definite need, in my opinion, to bring together, we have silos here at the city, even though we work real well across silos, I want to part particularly to focus on the utility um, utility funds and the rates that are there, and to make sure that we can we have we don't have the management reports, the type of management information that we need um, at times, and we so therefore this position will help with that. It'll help with a myriad of bringing together a, a widespread citywide. There are different little individual standalone. Um, collection efforts that are made by collection. I mean, for instance, I invoice uh, College, College Town Kent annually, okay, for the parking lot use, okay, as an example. When I'm gone, I want to make sure that somebody is going to continue with that contractual um, arrangement so that we will continue getting that $25,000 annual for the parking lot maintenance, okay. That's just one example, but there's a there's a myriad of other mm -hmm. similar examples throughout the city. Community development has them. Um, you know, they've, they've got a, a number of them. So if we can use this function, this position, to consolidate and create some, a greater integrity, if you want to call it that, a greater assurance that, there's good, that these things are going to be done and managed going forward, we will be better off for that. Mm -hmm. um, so this is it's a different topic. Uh, have you noticed any appreciable change in our health insurance costs for the city? Is that something that is um, easy to predict, or is it? Do you feel that it's slightly volatile, or? Seems like every. I mean, every year we look at our cost because we're self-insured. <coughs> okay, this this it, it's. Um, um, difficult to read sometimes, okay, because when you talk about insuring, you can have some bad years and you can have some not so bad years, okay, and that's what we, and we do experience that fundamentally, and um, so we have increased that allocation for, um, on an individual employee basis uh, annually since I've been here, okay, and um, uh, and it keeps, you know, it's so far it's been able to, to meet our expenses. All right, and that's where we're at. And um, uh, the <laughs> consultants that we work with, uh, the broker that we work with on this, I think are very uh, helpful in, in the information that they provide us um, in managing our, our health plan. And um, so, um, not sure how else to answer it exactly. I, uh, I just yeah. uh, you you did. I just wanted yeah. to know if, if that was if that was something that was that was a challenge or not, or was that there was a noticeable difference. Yeah, it doesn't sound. It doesn't that, sound like well. No, I mean it's a challenge for every employer. There's no question about it. But I I would say, in general, I think we probably um, fare better than than many employers do. Quite honestly. Yes, it sounds yeah. like it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And we do have a, a very. A very benefit-rich plan, quite honestly, for our employees. Oh, yeah. I mean, I hope they appreciate what they have. I think they do, but we try to do everything we can. Uh, I know, uh, and staff and management to keep reminding them how lucky they are because That's it's a very lucky. rich, benefit-rich plan. <laughs> well, because if it, if the costs are, you know, if the costs are going up and and the city is continuing mm -hmm. to kind of meet that, so the employee isn't yeah. the employee isn't realizing it, then that yeah. that. It's essentially a, a raise every, you know, but oh, through, no through health insurance. About, so no so long as that's about that. No question yeah. about that. And we do have to reevaluate on an annual basis, or well, I say on an annual, on a, 
$4,000. Contractual, uh, contractual basis. Thank you. Thank you. The employee contribution portion, and you know, we did change that a couple of years back with the, uh, the, um, re the contract renewals at that time, mm -hmm. and that's just something that is just part of the uh, three-year cycle of uh, contract renewals as we have to reevaluate uh, the employee okay. contribution. Thank you. Oh, so. I would add one other quick thing. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll get. I'll get to. <laughs> But there's some other things. I talked about the, the value that this um, that our broker, our administrators brought to us. The Teladoc, okay, the Teladoc has been a great feature that we've added, and it, it is saving us. It is saving us a great deal of money at this point in time. So that's an enhancement. It's an enhancement for the for the individual employee and their family. So it's a win-win situation. That teledoc is. Can you tell me what the teledoc is? I'm sorry. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, that's fantastic. Self-service hmm. cash. Isn't that cool? That's awesome. Very cool. We work smarter. See how smart that is? Oh, that's very good. <laughs> I'm so, yeah. so are you planning on getting this added employee situated before you retire? I doubt that'll happen. I really doubt that'll happen. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm still waffling on my actual date. Um, but um, um, in all honesty, I doubt that'll happen. Um, but. Uh, Believe me, there's uh, Dave. Dave knows. Suzanne knows. So there's a number of people that understand exactly what we're looking for and exactly what we want to accomplish with that position. I'm confident that that will be um, uh, applied as I envisioned it. So. Well, in the meantime, then, who is going to take care of all the? The new person will take care of all the fees and things that you're collecting at the present time. Because you said it'll continue like this, to be like it'll this. continue to be as is. So we'll continue to have some of the, the separation, uh, if you will, the, you know, the, the uh, fragmentation, whatever you want to call it, um, throughout the organization. Those those standalones will continue for the foreseeable future until this new person can get their feet on the ground. Mm -hmm. Further questions? Yeah, one more. Oh. Just one. Just one. Uh, Dave, I know I've asked this almost every year, and I almost forgot to ask it this year. So as far as our debt service is concerned, we've worked hard to reduce that. And, and from, a, from your perspective, are we healthy in terms of the debt service that we are currently carrying? I think that's one of, the, one, that's one of our real strengths, quite honestly, and one of our pluses that we can be proud of because, um, you know, we, we know we've got, you know, the, the long-term debt that's outstanding is all um, dedicated, okay? The, the TIF supports you know the the debt that's related to the parking part of garage and the likes of that and um so we've got um dedicated revenue sources matched with the long-term debt um in those cases same thing with the police station okay exact same thing there so our long-term debt is fixed granted our long-term debt has increased but we've, we've got something to show for it right. mm -hmm. so um and it will probably increase again with a new City Hall, I expect, but our short-term debt, which is really where your rate risk is and where your um, a lot of your unknowns exist, and your annual cost of reissuance and so forth, there's a variety of things that go into your short-term debt. Um, we've been very fortunate to be able to continue paying that down. This in 2020 will be the last and final payment um, for the fire department: $255,000 a year in principal alone. Um, that will be a significant help to the budget. Mm. So, um, so the city's pay-as-you-go philosophy, I think, um, has kept Kent in an enviable position overall. But enviable doesn't mean you let your let you put off the gas and that you you know that you don't keep monitoring, you don't keep pressing. But um, when I talk to our our peer communities and so forth. Uh, I, 
I feel pretty good, except for Aurora. But I, <laughs> <laughs> that, they skew there. Don't worry. They're, they're skew. They're, them and they and Hudson live in their own world. <laughs> right. But you know, but but I'm talking about normal. Right. I guess what I'm asking, Dave, is that our ratio of our debt to Not our ones. our actual mm -hmm. income is we're we're in very good shape on that. Yeah. quite honestly, yeah. yeah. I know that, but I just wanted to make sure that I was we right are. looking at that. Yeah. Um, the only thing I do know that I mean, as we get into the new the new uh, admin building. Um, it's gonna, there's going to be some challenges there. Sure. There's going to be some challenges as to what the total cost is going to be on that. There's going to be some challenges as to the, the timing and the best way to fund that. I suspect it probably will go into short-term notes initially uh, for most of it. But at some point, you'll want to bond out, I would think, to, again, avoid great risk. Although, frankly, the markets work pretty darn good for the fire department. But um, I'm not so sure here again. This is another one of those areas that just because it's worked in the past doesn't mean it will continue to work well in the future. So, um, and I it would expect that my replacement will be uh, very knowledgeable and savvy about the market or rely on our financial advisors for that information uh, because that's going to be a part of the equation in making that determination. But we have that room right now. Is what We've got the room, yeah, yeah. So, don't screw it up. When's your last day? Pretty soon. Pretty soon. The last <laughs> is there a date? <laughs> huh? Is there a date? I, no, I said I've been waffling on it. It was going to be January 5th. Now I'm now I'm looking at maybe the end of January. 2021? <laughs> yeah, it's got a 2020 on it. Yeah. So, John, you have further questions? When, when we uh, built a parking deck, we borrowed uh, what ten million dollars? No, four million. Four million, and we did that on short-term notes. And initially. Initially, and then what? We converted that. Correct. Mm -hmm. So is that paid off now? No, that's in a that's in a long that's in. A, it's in there. Oh, you look back at nine two, page nine two. Um, right you'll see. Um, you see general obligation, but if you look at the right up towards the top, you see general obligation bonds. Uh, LT is long term general obligation, Alley 4 improvements, long term general obligation, downtown parking improvements. Those are the uh, the debts that we have that correspond to that. Uh, yeah, I, didn't, my, I don't have my book. I just kind of wonder what the balance was and what percentage we're paying. And there was well, there were other things other than just the parking garage that went into that. You know, we had our initial cash outlay for the parking meters, I believe. That was all part of that TIF um, area, which, of course, uh, Ms. Suso is about to, uh, in this 2020 budget, is replacement on a number of those units, which we expect that to be required on a periodic basis. So there's a capital expense for that. Sure. There again, that kind of blows up the budget a little bit, but there's a long term, there's, there's, a, there's an offset to it <clears throat> and, and a purpose for it that is valid. So the balance is what on that? About three million. Three million. We still owe three million on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The street and sidewalk program. Just further questions. Move to approve. Second. Second. With emergency. Do we need an emergency? emergency? Automatic discussion. Nice job, dude. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very good. Aye. 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 Thanks, Dave. Nice job. Thank you. Okay. okay. We have one more. 2020 position. Who's this? Yeah. Is that you, too? No, that's, that's uh, that. Oh, uh, there she oh goes. Suzanne. Suzanne. <laughs> Suzanne's going to be last from now on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first one uh, I guess before I, guess I, hard to beat I thought you were going to hand one something out, Suzanne. <laughs> Suzanne. Suzanne. Hey, Melanie. This, Are we no, done with putting Christmas oh, lights on? Oh, okay. I love the bridge. What about the gazebo? That's it?
awful dark. That was home savings, was it? Hometown. Mr. Delon. Yes. This this item is usually um, talked about in executive session. Okay, then we have to. And then so so we ask that you go into executive session uh, so that we All can. All right, Jack, do your thing. Okay. We need an executive session in accordance with Ohio Revised Code, paragraph 121.22, section G, item 1, to consider the appointment, employment, dismissal, discipline, promotion, demotion, or compensation of a public employee or official, or the investigation of charges or complaints against a public employee official, licensee, or regulated individual, unless a public employee official, licensee, or regulated individual requests a public hearing. So I move. Motion. I move. Second. Second. Any discussion? We have to have a roll call. Do we have to excuse um, Garrett? Garrett, Garrett now. Yeah. We'll do that when you're done. Okay. Mr. Amray? Yes. Mr. De Leon? Yes. Mr. Ferrara? Absent. Mr. Kuhar? Yes. Ms. Rosenberg? Yes. Ms. Schaefer? Yes. Mr. Sidoti? Yes. Mr. Turner? Yes. And Ms. Wallach? Yes. Mr. Ferrer is asked to be excused. I have a motion. Move to excuse Second. 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 All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you. Uh, Our only audience. Five minutes to clear the room out. <laughs> <laughs> Caitlin, if you need more time. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. okay. <laughs> Can we take a little break then? Sure. Hi. Hey, Okay, I probably have to get them. I can send you an email. Okay, that works. They'd have kept that for a million in the short term okay. notice. It'd probably own a million. Really? Okay, absolutely. It's the next page. I couldn't believe right from the start they wanted to sell bonds at 60 percent. Oh, record for you. Yes. Okay. And you emailed me before, right? Right, right, right. Wait, what's your name? I don't have any, I don't do any financial. And we pay, and we paid somebody to give us that advice. Oh, you we don't care how much we spend, at least we know how much our bill is going to be. I had never seen one before, I didn't know anything about it. So. Yeah, it's all finished. I have had a heck of a time trying to get people to sign this. They're just like, oh, well, what's so you like you're not mind, it's just So his name's on the ballot. It's like you're not committing to anything. That's, that's next. Yeah.